Hi. Um, the the title of, of my talk is kind of nondescript, programming with math. Uh, this is because uh, w w when I got the invitation, I was supposed, like half a year ago or so, you know, I, I had to come up with a title and some kind of description, and I wasn't sure what I would be interested in, right, you know, like at this, I, I keep changing my, my interest, so I didn't know what, what would be my current interest. Um, and I, I knew it would be mathematical, some, somewhat related to mathematics, so that was a safe bet, okay? But what I'm, and what I'm going to talk about will be related to mathematics, but it will be mathematics of type theory, okay? So we'll be talking about type theory. And type theory is, is really interesting to me. And every time I go to uh, a, a conference, I try to talk to people who, um, who don't like types, who like programming JavaScript or all these languages that are weakly typed, uh, trying to find out why would anyone want to use a language that doesn't have types, right? So my next slide, why people hate types. And, and there are actually good reasons to hate types, okay? So, so I will be like playing devil's advocate right now. Um, the main reason why types are a problem is that types limit our ability to reuse code. Right? We, when, when we write code, like if, if you went to the previous um, talk uh, by Chris, um, he gave lots of examples of, of, uh, of code in which types were really, really useful. But these were all um, concrete examples, right? But there is this, this other side of the coin when people are trying to write libraries. Right? And in libraries, you want to write code that's reusable. Or you write some code and you decide, OK, I want to be more general than this. Right? And I'm stuck with this particular type. How do I generalize over types? So this is a huge problem. And in most languages, generic code is really hard to write. Right? It's, it's like working with, with types, working on types, right? Using types as variables essentially requires you to learn a different language, right? It's like uh, in, in C++, for instance, I, I used to be a C++ programmer. In C++, it was really fun because you had to learn this new language, the, these, these uh, uh, less than, greater than brackets, you know, and it's, uh, it's like, uh, it's a completely different language. It's a very complicated, complex language, and you have to be like a real guru in order to program in this, in this new language. And then when you make a mistake, oh, Gosh, the, the type errors are so cryptic, right? I mean, anybody who's seen type errors in, in template code in C++ will know. So it is really difficult to use types uh, when you write reusable code. And there is a proof of this. The proof is JavaScript. JavaScript has lots of libraries. It's many, many more libraries than C++. C++ is an older language, and it has, it's like every time I went to like a C++ meeting, there was always this complaint about, like, why don't we have libraries to do this or to do that? Like, every other language has all these libraries, and C++ doesn't. Why doesn't it? Because it's extremely hard to write libraries. And, and there, uh, there are these few, I, I mean, fingers of one hand or two hands, maybe, uh, gurus who can write really reusable libraries of the quality, the of standard library quality, you know? And it's like there is a new addition to the standard library every few years or so, 
On the other hand, they he types help us with bugs, right? The type checker is like this uh, amazing tool, it, and it comes free with, with your compiler. It detects bugs in your code. So it's, I mean, if somebody told you, you know, you're a JavaScript programmer, you know, I have this product, you know, how much would you pay for it? It goes over your, your program and checks it for errors and gives you like error reports. You know, how much would you pay for it? With strongly typed languages, you get it for free. And then types provide you with some kind of documentation. Right? I mean, in JavaScript, there is a function that takes an object and returns an object. OK, what kind of object? Well, there has to be some kind of documentation that says, well, this object has to have this field and that field and so on, and that field has to have another field and so on. So where do you put this documentation? Right? You, you, you write comments, maybe, uh, or maybe you have a separate document or so on. Well, types, actually, provide this kind of documentation that is checkable by the compiler. So it never goes out of, you know, it's like it never goes obsolete. And it it's actually can help you in designing your code, not, not in many languages, but like the, the more strongly typed the languages, the more people actually use this idea of type-driven development. And um, in Haskell, a lot of development is, do is, is done this way. Uh, and, and in dependent type languages like Idris, you know, there is like a whole book about type-driven development. And, and going back to JavaScript, OK, there are so many libraries. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> we agree, right? <laughs> so. What is the problem? Is, is this inherent in, uh, in typed languages that they have to be so hard to use? Uh, or is, it, is, it, is there a reason for this um, that can be overcome? Can we overcome this problem? So the, 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 let's go to the source of the problem, OK? So, one, one source of the problem is that most strongly typed languages, uh, and, and I'm not pointing fingers, um, have a very ad hoc type system that was developed uh, organically that started by specifying types as, you know, this is how the stuff is stored in memory, okay? It uses so many bytes, and these bytes are followed by these bytes, and so on. So it started at very, very low level, and then you have pointers, right, which are addresses in memory and so on. So you start with this low level, and, you, and then you start to build up a, a, a more abstract type system, and, um, and you end up with this kitchen sink of the type system, okay? And, and, uh, and then you try to add generic types in order to build libraries. You, you need some kind of genericity. Right? You have to abstract over types. And so you add them as an afterthought. It's like C started without any generic types. Right? You had to use macros. Then C++ came, didn't have anything. And then they came up with uh, templates, okay, because they wanted to write the standard template library, STL. Um, so, so it was added. Right? Then Java came and generic types, uh, you know, like let's do everything with casting and so on. Um, void pointers, casting, what, what have you, right? Uh, and eventually they decide, oh, okay, we really need something, uh, so let's just add on top of an existing language without really thinking about it from the very beginning. Right? And now we have some new languages that say, no, no, no generic programming. And, and of course, in a few years from now, they will have generic programming. <laughs> right? <laughs> you can <laughs> quote me on that. <laughs> OK. Uh, 
but there is there is a good theory. Okay, this is what I was uh, what I'm going to talk about. There is a good good theory, and, and uh, most language designers uh, ignore this theory because it's it's a hard theory. It's not an 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 easy theory. It's it's like abstract mathematics. Okay, but. My point is that without these good basics, you know, if you don't have good foundations in your language, uh, then it's really, really hard to build these higher level abstractions that will let you reuse code, let you write generic code that then can be reused so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And, um, and there is a systematic type theory and uh, it's it's uh, by this Swedish guy, okay, Per Martin Love, if I pronounce it correctly. Okay, so so he he's uh, this, this is not such an old theory, you know. I mean, uh, he's still alive. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's not it's not like lambda calculus, right? But, uh, um, so, so this this guy actually um, wrote a, th a, a, a theory that's mathematical theory, but but it can be used to to describe things like algebraic data types, and and actually also dependent types. So this theory encompasses all this all this stuff. But interestingly enough, it's it's a theory that has. Um, Nothing to do with programming. Um, I, I don't think uh, he was uh, coming up with type theory thinking about, about programming. I don't know exactly what the history was, but it, was, it had more to do with, with logic, with uh, uh, intuitionistic logic. And, and the connection between logic and programming is, uh, was discovered um, Later, as uh, these propositions as types, um, Curry-Howard isomorphism, which says that it's actually the same theory, that intuitionistic logic, type theory, is the same thing. And in fact, it's also the same thing as category theory. And I, I usually talk about category theory. This time, I'm not going uh, to, to really talk much about category theory. but. All these ideas um, can be found in all three areas, in programming, in category theory, and in type theory, and in logic. Okay? So that's four. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, and of course, from category theory, we, we know that there are these higher order things, uh, higher level abstractions like monads, monoids, uh, functors, and so on. So generic programming, for me, generic programming is, is really abstracting over types. You want to write code uh, that is typed, but then you want to abstract over some set of types and saying my code will not, will not only work for these types, but will work for a bigger set of types, right? So generic types. Uh, you have to introduce generic types. So these are like three major things that, that you have to do in order to have uh, generic code. Uh, you have to be able to construct types from types. So you need some kind of functions on types. Uh, example, uh, from, from C++, let's say, vector. Vector is really a function on types. It takes type T, it creates a type vector of T, right? And then you can apply this function to a particular type and you get a vector of ints or a vector of booleans and so on, right? But the, the vector that you get from the standard library is really a function on types or a type constructor, okay? So keep this in mind, that this is what, what actually happens. Oops. Um, 
functions on types, right? Um, in order to define functions on types, right, how do you define a function? Well, you write a definition of a function. On the right-hand side of a definition of a function, you have some kind of expression on types. So in order to be able to construct uh, functions of types, you have to be able to write expressions on types. Okay, so then a function is, is, you know, lambda of some type equals expression on types. And so you need a theory of building expressions from types, not from values, but from types. And this is called the algebraic data types. And then finally, the most important thing, you want, you want to have these generic algorithms. And these generic algorithms are nothing more but polymorphic functions polymorphic functions that work on multiple types at the same time, okay? So you write one polymorphic function and it will accept a generic type, meaning it will work for any type that this generic type uh, can produce. And as always in a systematic approach, you know, you want, you want to decompose your problem and, and then recompose the solution, right? So when, when, when you want to decompose the problem of type theory, well, you have to start with something, with some primitive things, right? So you have to define your primitives. Then you have to define ways of composing these primitive things, right? And composing things that you compose from primitive things and so on. So, so you have this and this there is a whole science of composing things, okay? And actually, there are several sciences that are equivalent of composing things from simpler things. And they are things like logic, there's category theory, and there's type theory. And no wonder they are actually the same theory using just different notation, because all these theories talk about composing things from simpler things, okay? So without further ado, let me introduce the unit. So this is our primitive. This is the most primitive type that you can have. But let's start with logic, okay? Because all these types start from logic. So in logic, this is equivalent to the truth value, truth, T is always available. It's like if you want, if you say something depends on truth, you know, you can take this truth from anywhere. It just exists, uh, truth value, okay? It has to exist. In programming, by Curry-Howard isomorphism, this is equivalent to the type called unit. In, in Haskell, this is like an empty pair of parentheses, a, a null tuple. Uh, in C++, it's, it's, and in Java, it's wrongly kind of called void, um, because void should be something that's empty. And if you ask a C++ programmer what is the type void, they will say oh, it's an empty type. No, it's not empty. It has one value only. It, it's a token that you assume that exists and you don't have to explicitly pass it, right? But if this were a void type, meaning an empty set, you wouldn't be able to call a function that takes a void because you can never generate a value of type for, uh, which is an element of an empty set. An empty set is empty, so you would never be able to call it. So it's really a um, unit, okay? And in set theory, Set theory is very useful because set theory provides this, this model for, for all these types. I mean, the type theory is, is completely abstract, but it has a model. It's like, okay, for every type, I can, I can find something in type theory, in set theory that corresponds to it. And in this case, it's a, it's a singleton set. A singleton set contains just one element. All singleton sets are isomorphic, so it's just pick one singleton set has one element, and that's it. But in type theory, which is, which is abstract, every type is defined by introduction and elimination. 
What does it mean? How do you introduce a type? Where do you get it from? Meaning, what are the constructors? What are the functions that return this type? Okay? What kind of things you need in order to produce an element of this type? And in the, in the case of unit, the introduction is trivial. You don't need anything. The unit exists. Okay, so the introduction is trivial. We'll see later introduction and, and elimination rules for other things that are more complex and they make more sense. Unit is just special, okay? Uh, it has no elimination because it has no... Elimination means, f uh, you know, what, do you, what can you do with it? Like can you, how can you extract information from it? You cannot extract information from, from unit because it has no information. It just exists. Okay? And there is a dual to this. There is, there is the, well, in, in logic, you have false, right? Uh, in um, the false value, and it corresponds to an empty set in set theory, and it corresponds in, in, in Haskell, actually, there is a type void that corresponds to an empty set, okay? It's not very useful. Um, uh, it has no introduction because you cannot produce an element of an empty set because uh, there aren't any, right? Um, so let's get to the next one, the interesting one, products. Okay, so where do products come from? Um, so all these things actually come from uh, the way we decompose reality. And the first thing that, that we found out about composition is I have one thing, I have another thing, now I have both things. Okay? This is like just like so trivial, right? And this corresponds to what we call a product. I mean, you might think it's a sum, but, but no, really, it's, 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 uh, it's called a product. And, and again, I'll start with logic. Okay, in logic, uh, this thing of combining two things into one is called conjunction, A and B. How do you uh, produce a conjunction? How do you prove uh, that A and B is true? Well, you have to prove A and you have to prove B. So you need two proofs in order to prove the conjunction, right? This corresponds, in programming, it corresponds to pairs. So a conjunction compares, it corresponds to creating a pair of two types, okay? Which naturally generalize to tuples, it's like if you ha have a pair, you can have a triple, quadruple, and so on. Uh, then you want to, so these, these are sort of anonymous parts, like first, second, third, okay? You, you can give them names, and then you have structs, you have records, right? In other languages, it says the data uh, part of, of a class is, is, these are all product types, because when you construct them, you have to provide all the ingredients, right? And this is how products are defined. In set theory, this is called Cartesian product of sets, okay? What's the introduction? And I'll, I'll write it in, in, in Haskell speak, okay? So in order to create or construct a pair of A and B, you have to provide an element of A, and you have to provide an element of B. Okay, so this is like a function that takes something of A, something of B, and produces a pair AB. It's like Haskell notation is, is very, very concise. Um, um, in, in C++, you have a definition of a pair in the standard library, and it's like a pages long. Okay, this is, this is what you have in Haskell. Because Haskell, Haskell uh, like is built from, from the ground up. It's actually built from the theory. So it's, it's not an ad hoc thing added later. Okay? Um, so this is how you construct it. And notice uh, this, this parallel with logic, right? In order to prove uh, 
a conjunction, you need a proof of A and a proof of B. In order to construct a pair, you need a value of A and a value of type B. Having a value of type A corresponds to having a proof of this proposition A. Okay, so type is equivalent to a proposition. And the truth of a proposition corresponds to having an element. An element is actually a proof that this pr thing. It's like we, we usually deal with types that actually have elements, right? So, and we can provide elements of these types uh, easily. But, but it's not always true. I mean, there, like you can, you can define function types, for instance. And if you don't have an implementation or the implementation is impossible, um, then, then it's an empty type, right? Elimination. Um, if, if you give me a pair, what can I do with this pair? I can, I, the first thing I do with the pair, I can do other stuff later, but the first thing that I can do with the pair is extract A or I can extract B. So these are these two functions in Haskell. First, takes a pair and returns a value of, of A. And this is the value that I put there in the constructor. How do I know that, that it's the same value? Well, because in type theory, there are also these coherence conditions which say, if you construct a pair using A and B, and then you extract the first component, you'll get back A. Okay, so there's an like, additional constraint. Um, and also, uh, if, you, if you give me a pair and then I extract A and I extract B and then I combine them together using the introduction into a pair AB, I'll get the same pair back, okay? Seems trivial, but this is like the coherence condition and it's enough to define what the product is, okay? So if we have products, we also have sums and unfortunately in most languages, uh, sums are like not really supported very well it's, and, and they come much later in life. Um, uh, but, but from the point of view of, of type theory, they are, they are uh, extremely important. Uh, they correspond to the dual to, um, uh, to, to product um, and in logic they, they correspond to an alternative. So, so this is also this, this very old primitive uh, thing that our ancestor already knew. You know, I have a stone or I have a spear. I can bring food, okay? It doesn't matter whether I have a stone or a spear as long as I can, uh, like, hunt, right? So this is like the first uh, um, idea of abstraction, right? It doesn't really matter what tool it is as long as it helps me hunting, okay? So this, this or something or something is reflecting this idea of combining two things as an alternative. And in programming, this is, um, in Haskell, it's called either. Uh, when you extend this, like, either this or this or this or this, multiple things, then you get uh, unions, tagged unions, okay? Um, tagged unions were introduced in C++ quite recently, really. I mean, this, this hasn't been for very long. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in, in Haskell, when, when, you, when you do a sum type, like either is a sum type, right, you put this vertical bar, right? Look how much time do I have? It's like, oh, 10 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew that. I, it's just like, okay. So in set theory, this is, this is called a disjoint, un disjoint union, okay? So like, all these things have their parallels in, uh, in logic, in uh, programming, in set theory. Um, there is an introduction, so there are two constructors. You either give me a value of the left type or you give me a value of the right type. You don't have to give me both, okay? One, one is enough. So introduction is easy. Um, 
Elimination is a little bit more uh, complicated because you have to do pattern matching. This is what you do in, in, in Haskell. Uh, in other languages, I guess uh, you do some kind of case statements saying, is this the type or is that the type, and so on. Um, what is important here is that if you do pattern matching, <clears throat> that you have to take into account that it could be of type uh, A or it could be of type B. You don't know up front. Somebody gives you a value of, of a some type, you have to be prepared for both. So in order to process it, you really need two different functions. Okay? So you need a pair of functions to process a sum of types. Okay? So there is this nice duality. Okay? So, since I don't have much time, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you uh, that there is, uh, there is also exponentials, right? Which correspond, and this is the interesting part, because they correspond in logic to implication. If I have an A, then I can produce B. If you give me a proof of A, I can take this proof, manipulate it, manipulate it, and I get a proof of B, okay? So this manipulation of a proof of A corresponds in programming to functions, okay? So here, here's an example of, of, of manipulation of, of, a, uh, of an um, logical thing. It's like if I have A and B and C, then I, have, I can prove A and B and C and so on, right? Um, so the, the, the idea of exponential or, or implication or uh, is translated into programming as functions. So you have function types, okay? Function types, um, and, and also, I mean, every, every programming language has functions, really, um, but not as first-class citizens. This is like a recent thing that they added lambdas to, um, to Java, for instance, right? I mean, years, a few years, right? Um, so treating uh, functions as first-class citizens, just like pairs and, and uh, ethers and unions, right? It's, it's, um, but it's, it, it means that if, if you have a type of a function, it means that you can create a function that takes this type as an argument or returns this type as an argument. So it makes functions first-class citizens. Okay? And, and here, here is uh, like the proof of this statement in logic is translated into a function that takes an x, as if, is, which is of this type, a and B and C, and just takes first of first, second of first, second, and so on, right? So, so implementing this function is the same as the proof of this statement, okay? Anytime you implement a function in your language, you are proving a statement, okay? So you are doing logic. I, I keep saying, you know, we programmers are mathematicians. And this is the proof, okay? <laughs> so in set theory, you know, we have like a set of functions between two uh, sets, set of functions between two sets. And the introduction is through a lambda, okay? So this is like the lambda in, in Haskell, but you now have lambda in uh, almost every language, right? And the elimination is, uh, the elimin well, okay. The elimination is by just applying this function, right? So you just apply, the, you, you provide the argument, which is like providing the proof of x, of, the, of a, right? And you get a value of type b, which is a proof of b, right? Okay. Elimination, evaluation, so just function application in, in Haskell is very simple. Okay? So I'm going to quickly skip through uh, <laughs> the rest uh, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> just give you a, a little 
uh, taste of like this is really really algebra. So you you know you 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 have like one times a equals a. That's an algebraic equation. Like can you translate it into types? One is unit. A is type A. You know. Uh, so that's the proof in uh, in in Haskell, right? It's a pair. Product is a pair of unit and A is the same as A. Not exactly the same, but it's like you can get one from another, and another from. So they are isomorphic, you know. You can do with exponentials. It's much uh, nicer because you you have these. Um, these, these translate into function types. This one says a function from a sum type is a, is a pair of functions. That's what I showed you when, when we did the pattern matching, right? Yeah, so, so that's, that's Haskell notation for this statement. Um, in particular, a square is like a function from a Boolean to a, which is a pair of values. One for false, one for, tr one for true, right? Um, and, and the last one is, is the interesting one uh, because in Haskell it's, it, it corresponds to currying, right? A, f a function from a pair, which is a function of two arguments, is the same as a function that returns a function. So it's called currying. And it's just this, this algebraic equation. Okay? And once you have the algebra, then you can define functions. So here's a function. Ta-da! Okay. Uh, I, I put a capital lambda because it's a function on types. Okay. So it takes a type A and produces 1 plus A. Okay. Because now I can do algebra. Okay. What is this? It's a maybe. 1 corresponds to this constructor nothing, which is just a unit. Right, because it does not require anything and it has only one value. And A is a constructor called just. It just keeps A. Right? So this is how we produce maybe, you know. This is called the type constructor. Uh, and, and it has two data constructors, nothing and, and just. So given the algebra of types, I can now produce function on functions on types. And functions on types are the, the necessary ingredient for generic programming, right? This is what we started with, the idea that, that we need functions on types. And having algebraic types, uh, OK, I'm not going to go through this, but <laughs> you can you can like generalize this stuff to infinite products, infinite sums, which are which are these existential types. Um, all this this is all really fascinating stuff, <laughs> and I'm gonna tease you. Right? Uh, it's, it's <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, existential types, <clears throat> and then of course you need recursion. Right, and, and recursion is just uh, well, the advantage of recursion is that you get a Turing complete language. Uh, you pay a price for it, which is that you get non-terminating uh, functions, right? Because a, a, a recursive function can go on forever, right? <coughs> but recursive types correspond to uh, to having definitions that. Um, that require that also algebraic equations, but you have to solve them, okay? Because they have the, your variable on both sides. Like define L of A as one plus A times L of A. This is a definition of a list, okay? Ta-da! <laughs> right? It's a recursive definition, but it follows, you know, the same the same idea of of of, of doing algebra. Okay, and here's the conclusion. Okay, so what what you what's important to know is that there is a very strong foundation for types. There is type theory. 
And if you are going afterwards, you know, and, and uh, try to invent your own language, like every programmer at some point invents their own language, you know, please start by studying type theory <laughs> so that you don't have to, like, add things later on and say, well, okay, I didn't think about this, I didn't think about that, uh, and my, my users are, are just complaining, complaining, and so on, right? Uh, generic programming is programming with types, okay? So you have to abstract over types. And, uh, and the main tool is like when you want to construct new types that depend on other types, you need to define functions on types, okay? In order to define functions on, on types, you, you have to be able to create expressions to be the right-hand sides of these functions or bodies of these functions, right? So in order to create expressions, you need some kind of algebra of types. And this is very well theoretically founded. The, 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 the algebra of types is very well founded. And then, of course, you, you, as you progress, you, you get into these recursive types, and they are just like higher-order algebra when you actually try to solve equations, right, that you can write. Having the algebra of types, you can write equations and you can solve them. Solving equations really means finding a fixed point for a given equation. That's a completely separate topic for, for an, another talk. Um, and, and finally, once you have this figured out, how to create types uh, using algebra and using recursion, then you can write your generic algorithms, which are just polymorphic functions that operate on these generic types. Okay? So that's, that's all I have to say today. Thank you.